Hey guys, it's Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we've got Rob Mitchell here to talk about auction market theory and trading with value. Rob's been trading for about 30 years. Uh, he is a trader that relies on volume analysis to pinpoint support and resistance and key areas to trade from in the market. He has won the World Cup Advisor Trading Championship, and he created his own CTA group, Creative Capital Management. Uh, back in April 99. Uh, the topics for today include auction market theory, just a general overview and discussion, uh, specifically how to determine value from the marketplace, and understanding market context, uh, understanding what these support and resistance lines mean when viewed in context, and also uh, creating a daily trading plan to trade from. Uh, Matt from Optimus Futures is also here today. And it's because of Matt that we have been introduced to Rob Mitchell. So before we get started with Rob, I'm going to very briefly turn things over to Matt at Optimus Futures. He's going to give you a quick overview of what uh, services Optimus provides and answer any questions that you have from Optimus. And then we'll turn things over to Rob. As you guys have questions, type them into the questions box. We'll do our best to get everyone's questions answered today. And I will also post the recording for this webinar on the site sometime tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Give me one second, and I'll turn things over to Matt. You can can um, can have an indication if uh, somebody if you guys can hear me. We can hear you and we see your Internet Explorer window. Okay. All right. So I'll just open the main thing. This is our main screen. So everybody will just uh, <clears throat> focus on that. Um, okay. So, uh, Mike, thank you for uh, bringing me here. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody on the forum. I enjoy interacting with you. And I always thank Mike for running one of the most courteous and most informative um, forums out there. I mean, I'm just uh, astonished that they, I've seen forums over the years. I've never seen anything that grew like that and uh, such friendship has developed between people, forums, and traders really and sincerely trying to help one another. Um, I wanted to bring you Rob today before I talk about Rhythmic. Uh, Rob is one of my dearest friends in this industry. Um, had a lot of influence on in the way I think and believe it or not, had a lot of influence on in the way also run my brokerage and the philosophy that I have behind this brokerage as far as margins and commissions, and how we treat people and so forth. Um, and talking to him about markets is probably one of the more intelligent conversations that I have out there with uh, third-party vendors. So you'll enjoy him very much. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Optimus Trading Group, uh, we're basically a, a discount brokerage firm. This is where majority of our business goes. Um, probably 80% the rest. Um, we also execute systems for people. We execute uh, commodity trading advisors, business here as well, people who are, uh, have shown that they have a track record and so forth. They use our execution services. Uh, it's Optimus because we have a very good and organized uh, back office. Uh, bear with me one second. I'm just going to disable everything here. Um, so. Uh, Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> uh, the main solution that we use for our uh, platforms is Rhythmic. Um, and we just found it to be the best solution for us. Uh, as you guys know, always respect whatever other people are using. We right now just have uh, hooked up every single platform to it. Um, NinjaTrader, MultiCharts, Trade Navigator, Market Delta, RT Investor, and so forth. So the vision I see uh, for Op Optimus Trading Group um, in the future is really to facilitate and help people on the technology side to get better execution, better pricing, uh, better handle on, on trading. One of the things that we have uh, started is also a hosting solution, getting closer to the exchange, as you see here, um, the third service that we have here, right around here. And basically because I just want to help people get better execution if they're in a remote location. Just to show you part of the philosophy of Optimus uh, uh, Trading Group. In the future we'll be focusing um, on probably mobile applications, 
will be focusing uh, on additional technologies and other services that will help people with uh, risk management. Obviously, I can't disclose everything. Uh, this is a recorded webinar. There's competitors out there, so we're trying to keep a niche. Um, but basically, that's where I see the vision. The vision is not to have another salespeople who sit on the phone and yell all day, but really rather work with vendors out there who are good in uh, technology. And um, and I think the word is spread. I think on the discount side, I'll be very honest with you, I was probably one of the last brokers to get into um, the whole platform thing and everything and everything else. But because of Rhythmic, we were able to gain a lot of customers who have recognized you know, the, the quality um, of the feed, the quality of the technology, the services, and so forth. Um, that's basically it. If you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and answer me. I, I just want to allow a little more time for Rob to talk to education on this business, but of course, I'll um, answer anything. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, so, if anybody has questions about Optimus Futures, if you have questions about what they offer, what platforms they support, how to get started, go ahead and ask them now. And Matt, uh, I don't think you mentioned Sierra Chart, but it does work with Sierra, right? Yeah, correct. If, 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 I'm sorry if I forgot. Yes, we do. We work with uh, the main platform that everybody knows is Sierra Charts, Multi Charts, Ninja Trader. We work with Rhythmic's platform, which is our trader and our trader pro. Uh, recently, we have hooked up with uh, Trade Navigator, um, RT Investor, and, and Market Delta. So basically all the big ones out there. And, and we are bringing more platforms that we'll uh, definitely uh, work with, even okay. if there are smaller ones out there. Okay. And how how can someone uh, get a hold of you? Do you want to list an email address, or should they just use the sure. website? Um, absolutely. If if uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of me, it's a simple email. It's you know, I'll write it down here. It's Matt at optimistfutures.com, and you can always call me and ask me anything uh, that you want directly about uh, platforms, commissions. Um, in lieu of the recent events um, in the industry with uh, companies and compliance and so forth, I can right. address that to you as well. So uh, Kelly wants to know if you support TradeStation. Maybe you can answer how that works. Um, we we don't uh, support directly TradeStation customers. What we are, uh, we are a cus I, we have a, a professional license um, vendor through TradeStation. So if people want for example, have automated services. We can execute it on um, our platforms. For example, we hooked up NinjaTrader to um, TradeStation. So basically, we can take a, an algorithm from somebody, an easy language, run it for them, and execute it over here. We don't support the platform directly. Naturally, uh, TradeStation is our competitor, and they have their own technology and their own brokerage. Um, alternatively, yeah. there were some customers that, sorry, go ahead. I was going to just say, for those that don't know, TradeStation is a TradeStation is a closed system. They, you know, they're their own broker. That's that's all you get. <laughs> correct, correct. Um, for some other customers who who wanted to use um, um, our services, you know, some people we have uh, helped them translate their codes in Easy Language um, to uh, from Easy Language to Power Language with multi charts to run it through Rhythmic. So that's a possibility as well. Right. Okay, and then I see one more question, and then we can turn things over to Rob. Um, the question is, what controls does Optimus Futures have in place to prevent what happened uh, with PFG from occurring within your brokerage? That's a hot topic, so I'll give you a second to answer that. Um, I understand. I've actually, did, you know, in the last week has been a really, really difficult, uh, a very emotionally draining period for me, not because I had any ties to PFG, because it was just simply hard to talk to all the customers that had money over there and customers had a lot of money um, you know people sent them a lot of money and they trusted them and uh, you know because it was supposedly the the family that owned the business was uh, grain uh, were in the farming business for, for many years and you know farmers have a lot of trust between them so a lot of people trusted them and I would say a lot more with uh, um, than uh, the risk capital that you should put in futures, I think they had a lot more in them. So it's, for many people, it was very devastating. So I'm fully aware of it. Um, ourselves, you know, we're a guaranteed IB of Vision Financial Markets. It used to work for Vision Financial Markets, um, and I trust the people over there. 
Um, I have a very simple perspective on, on, on this thing. Businesses, you know, can go, I mean, businesses can fail. Um, if you have more money going out than money coming in, businesses fail. It takes a totally separate mentality to tap into customers' funds. Um, so I, after working all those years with Vision, and I've been working with them since my early 20s, I just refuse to believe that they're the, the kind of people who would do that. I know everybody, I worked right beside the ownership, I worked with compliance, worked with everybody else there, and I've seen what they've done when times are tough. And what they do is basically they tighten their belt a little bit and they say, you know what, look, you know, we can't do this and we can't do that. And I've seen them go through ups and downs. Um, so that's one thing. They have a very strong compliance. They're exchange members. They're in fair members, FTC. Um, and basically that's the only thing I can, I can tell customers, uh, you know, so far legally speaking. Um, I think what you have to do, and this is something that's not available to customers. Um, and this is something that I look at. You know, when you choose your clearing firm, and again, I respect every decision you make out there, with every broker or the FCM that you with and so forth. So I'm talking specifically about me and how I make my decisions. You know, I don't do business with, with companies. I do business with people. I avoided Refco, I avoided MF Global, and I avoided PFG. And, and I went through all the scandals. So. I was solicited by just everybody in the industry. What I like to know is the owners of the FCM, how they behave, if they're responsible, how fiscally they behave towards risk, how they assess risk, do they have proprietary trading, um, do they try to run a lot of businesses outside of the FCM that, um, that could have impact. And, and in general, believe it or not, I look at the lifestyle that they have. Um, so this is the one thing that uh, it's important to me as far as the individuals that I do business with. I think personality uh, plays a big role in who you choose to do business with. Um, and Mike, to be honest with you, your, your forum is great for that because you know there's enough information there for people to really make decisions of who is behind the scenes of those companies. Um, it's, it's pretty transparent and people discuss it and they share the information out there. So that's right. the one thing I would do, you know, not just look at CFTC and NFA records, really look behind the scene who's running those companies, they have prop desks, their personalities, how long they've been in business and so forth. Right. So it's um, okay, thank you. in a nutshell. That's, uh, right. Thank you for that. Uh, so if anybody has any further questions for Matt, then the website is optimistfutures.com and you can send him an email at matt at optimistfutures.com. All right, so thanks, Matt. Well, uh, we'll let you go. Thank I can you. see, you, see you your guys. phone. Your phone's literally ringing off the hook. <laughs> so give me one Thank second. God it does. <laughs> <laughs> give me a second. I'll turn things over to Rob. Hang on, guys. All right, Rob, you should be on. You should see the option to share your screen. Uh, I, I think I do here. Uh, you guys can hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for going through that with us. We had a little miscomputation. I have a lot of monitors here, and they're in uh, vertical configuration. So, uh, thanks for bearing with us on that. Uh, Mike, thanks very much for the uh, introduction, and uh, Matt, thank you also, and thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. Uh, I, I I kind of was holding myself back from saying some things about Matt. Um, Matt and I, uh, as he said, have known each other for many years, and um, uh, Matt's just a really good guy. I can sum it up that way, and he works for a very, what I see to be a very solid firm as well. So uh, without further delay, let's get into the presentation, because I have a lot to talk about, a lot of slides to cover, and uh, we'll have a Q&A session uh, at the end. And uh, so if you have any questions for me, uh, fire away at the end, um, but I'll try and get through this quickly. Uh, so we have plenty of time for that. Uh, before uh, going any further, uh, the CFTC disclaimer, past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. There's a risk of loss trading futures. That means you can lose more than you have in your account, and you need to be aware of those things when you open an account. So, um, One thing that I always like to talk up up front, it's probably an over-discussed subject, but uh, is trader psychology. And, uh, and I, I bring this up at first because it's at the core of of what I believe is a uh, an effective approach to trading, 
uh, and I hit it maybe a little differently than, than uh, other people might talk about, but if you uh, learn from uh, people who are great in sports or acting, for example, you'll find that they practice their craft to the point that they can do it without having any rational thought. And the idea is to get that rational mind out of the way. And you know, when you put a 70 millimeter camera six inches from somebody's face, and, and if even the slightest little twitch or flinch in their eye just totally gives them away, or um, many of us are more familiar with sports. You know, if you're playing basketball and you have any doubt as you, you know, go to make that layup, you know, you're probably going to fumble it somehow. And so, because the the rational mind comes in and starts analyzing things, and it's very paralyzing uh, for many people. And so, uh, to trade successfully as a discretionary trader, not as somebody who's firing through Trade Station, as uh, Mike and Matt were just discussing, uh, to a uh, FCM, but uh, if you are uh, trading on a discretionary basis throughout the day, and that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today, then uh, you're really in a much better position to get that rational thinking out of your way. And um, the way that you do this is you become so familiar with what it is you are doing that you can kind of throw it in the trash and let yourself just uh, act naturally and so uh, and, and intuitively. And so um, I, I'm a musician. I've studied bass for many years, and I've been a classical guitar player. And uh, a teacher that I have right now told me about a theory of learning. And he said that when you're under stress, you always reduce to first learn behaviors. And what this means is that if you learn, uh, in the case of music, if you learn to play that piece of music incorrectly from the beginning, uh, you don't practice it in time and you you uh, you approach it in a sloppy manner, then when you come under stress, when you walk out on that stage and you look out there and there's 3,000 people out there, you will naturally reduce to your first learned behavior, which is the bad way of playing it. You, may, you learned it wrong in the first place and then you overcame that and relearned it correctly. And then when you walk out on the stage, you go all the way back to the learning, have learning it wrong. And that's why I bring this up. If if you can learn things right from the beginning and approach everything correctly from the beginning, then it frees you uh, to be much stronger when you come under stress. Because the second you click that button, uh, you know, you're not on a sim trader, uh, you're really dealing with a whole different animal. And so uh, you're, you may be able to behave one way while you're sim trading and then as soon as you you know have a 500 bucks on the line or 750 or whatever it might be today for the lots you're trading and the stops you're using uh, you suddenly <laughs> you know, are back to some really bad habit and so uh, it's important to learn things right from the beginning and so I try to approach things structurally as we go through this webinar that will be that what I believe is that that structure that can uh, give you the foundation uh, in terms of market uh, auction theory. So um, I like to uh, talk about a, uh, a story uh, about an art auction. And uh, I believe in one of James Dalton books, uh, James Dalton are probably some of the best books on this uh, subject, but I believe the second one, Markets in Profile, uh, he talked about uh, this briefly, but it's, it's a very uh, instructive uh, point of looking at just exactly what is the market doing as it's going up and down and alternating uh, during the day. And uh, essentially, uh, what you have is an auction, but it's a continuous auction. So we can simplify that idea a little bit by talking simply about like an, an art auction for, let's say, just a painting. And um, let's say you, ha you have this painting for sale, and it's a very famous painting or something, and you have 50 people uh, come into the auction. And the reason these 50 people showed up at the auction is because they believed that the opening bid for that was a fair price or a good deal, probably more likely a good deal. And so what happens is they open bidding, say, at $100, and then at that point in time, everybody in the room agrees that it's worth 100 bucks, and the auctioneer then says, do I hear 110? And someone raises their hand, yes, I, I'll pay 110 for that. And then 
you know, it goes up a little more, and next thing you know, you're at 130. And, and at which point, certain people in this group of 50 people, this closed audience of 50 people, start saying, well, I'm not paying $130 for that thing. I mean, I, you know, I thought, you know, I came in here thinking if I could get it for 120 that that would be pretty good. And so what happens is, you know, three or four people now drop off. They're, they're no longer going to participate. They've decided it's not worth it. And then up it goes a little more higher and higher, 150, 180, 200, you know, who knows, sky's the limit. And uh, then something amazing happens. There's one person remaining in the room uh, who wins the auction. And at that point in time, uh, what is happening is there is 49 people in the room that think that the price is absolutely absurd. And there is one person in the room who bought it and is probably having some kind of buyer's remorse at that point. Oh my goodness, what did I do here? I just paid, you know, all this money for this painting. And, you know, I mean, the other people in the room might even be chuckling. What an idiot, you know. And so in the market, that would correspond with the high or the low of the day. In the market, that auction uh, can go down. Uh, that would be a reverse auction where you'd start it at, say, $100 and work it all the way down to $10 because nobody was interested in it at the initial bid of 100 And so there's a continual uh, evolving auction when we start doing this in the, uh, in the S&P or the Russell or, or whatever market uh, we might do. So when that last person uh, makes that purchase out of the 50, the one out of the 50, uh, there's officially at that point 98% of the population there agrees that the painting is not worth what it sold for. And so this inspires a couple of interesting things. If you know that you can sell, let's say that the painting uh, that is selling in this auction is duplicable, uh, then what, what would happen is those with a little bit of ingenuity would start thinking, well, you know, if people will pay that crazy amount for that painting, then I'm going to set up shop and go in business for myself, and I'm going to sell these things. I'm going to open up an art gallery, and I'm going to sell these things if people are willing to pay that kind of money. Now, of course, we're out in the extreme of a curve here, and so it's really not worth that amount, but there are cases where we see, you know, a real estate bubble. We all went through this that we know that prices will just continue climbing without any rational uh, thing. And it's usually driven by some other thing, like a lot of available money or something of this nature. Anyways, I just wanted to open up this idea uh, about what an auction really is and uh, what kinds of psychology and statistics are, uh, are, are behind this. And uh, the, because auction theory is really nothing more than what you learn in a statistics 101 course. It's really looking at price distributions and probabilities within those distributions. And typically these, uh, these things uh, are shown on a screen. And I'll, I will uh, go to this next slide and we'll, we'll uh, uh, talk about uh, what these things look like on a screen for those uh, who might not know. Uh, there's a couple of ways that you can look at them. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on today is volume at price. And what this means is for any given tick, the S&P, there's four ticks per point, and the Russell, there's, one, uh, there's 10 ticks per point. For each one of those ticks, what we're going to do is, over a given period of time looking back, we're going to accumulate the uh, ticks for each one of those prices, the, the uh, volume at each one of those prices. So in the case of our art auction, that very top high that the painting sold for, there's a one lot that, uh, that ultimately sold at that uh, price. What will happen is as you move back towards the price where people might have had more agreement as to what the uh, value was, that it was trading at a fair value, then uh, at that point uh, there will be uh, more volume at that point. And what you end up with on many days, and today is an example of this, is you end up with uh, what's called a bell curve distribution. And uh, so that is uh, where uh, the uh, high and low of the day have low volume, and then the, the price of the day closes somewhere in the central uh, part of that range between that high and the low. 
and the distribution is curved uh, around that. It's evenly distributed around that point. And uh, when you get this kind of a distribution, what it means is that there is agreement about the pricing at that central uh, tendency. And that would be called an, an average price. And so what happens is because that volume is very high in the center of that curve, uh, that means the majority of it agrees on uh, that pricing. And that is what we call value. Uh, there's a difference between the value and the pricing uh, that occurs. Uh, and, and, and the example of that is uh, anybody who goes out to shop a deal, uh, there's a difference between value and price. The, the price is what it's being advertised for. Price is simply an advertisement. And in auction theory, we say that uh, price moves lower in search of buyers, and it moves higher in search of sellers. And so the the actual value is what the collective population who may be participating in that price believe is a fair value, whereas the price is what it's selling at or trading at right now. And so this uh, auction theory, this use of statistics to analyze where the price is trading in time enables us to establish where the majority of participants likely see as a fair uh, pricing right now in, in, the, in the very recent past. And so uh, once we uh, have that uh, all figured out, then we don't really uh, have it, you know, it's not, not mysterious any longer. We now understand we're just dealing with a distribution. And um, I think uh, if I can uh, pull this up on the screen, I'll just draw this. Uh, um, Okay, I guess it won't. I, I don't know how to uh, draw this, but uh, if I just simply show, uh, let's say this day uh, 7-Eleven right here, because uh, I don't have today's on. Rob, you, here, you can draw if you want. On the on the left of the GoToWebinar, there's little icons. The bottom icon is uh, drawing tools. You can use that uh, if you want. Let's see. On the bottom left. On uh, this little bitty icons that are off to the side of the panel. And the bottom one is drawing tools. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm I'm just going to draw uh, right on here. And so, uh, if we have, uh, can you guys see that? All right. Yes. See my, yeah. My funny say. little drawing up there. Can you guys see that? Okay. If if this is the price uh, region that we're talking about, um, if I look at this bottom. Uh, little pivot right here, uh, that's going to be a very, if I just draw a box around this and I'm going to analyze the volume inside this, what I know is that down at this low one, I, I just have one, you know, one uh, unit of uh, volume right there. And as I go higher, I'm going to pick up two because I've got the V right there. And so I'll have a little bit more volume. And then as I get up to here, I, I'm going to start picking up this point, this V, so I'll have three points of volume. And then as I get here, I'm going to have four, one, two, three, four going across. I'm going to have another one there. And then, uh, and then as I get up in here, you know, I'm going to end up having the volume is going to kind of be like this. And because this has uh, all this volume up on top, I'm going to end up with a distribution that's kind of like this. And so it's going to be kind of a somewhat of a P-shaped. And we'll talk about the shapes in a little bit. Uh, but that's essentially what it's doing is just plotting the volume at each one of these ticks throughout this uh, this period of time that I have on there. And so uh, there are several different shapes that you get. Now I'm going to go over those uh, with you. Uh, I'm going to go over those with you in a little while. So uh, let's continue on to the to our next slide. If I can figure out how to turn the uh, here we go. Let me see if. Um, now I got to figure out how to turn it back off. Um, Does a skate hey, work? Uh, Mike, oh, let me try a skate. All right. Thanks for bearing with me on the uh, the newbie on the Citrix system. Okay, here we go, guys. We'll we'll get to this next 
uh, slide. So what we have here is a distribution uh, like what I've been talking about over the past several minutes over uh, each day. And so what it's doing is inside of each one of these days, it's drawing the, drawing the distribution uh, price, volume at price for each one of these. And then these upper and lower uh, bands that we have on here are the, uh, what are called the value area high and the value area low. And I think I'm going to uh, get to that uh, in a minute. So let's get to uh, areas of interest in terms. What the volume profile on the chart is doing is it's taking a statistical viewpoint of price distribution. And then the dashed cyan lines above and the dashed coral lines below and the value area high and low are called VAH and VAL, respectively. These are terms you will commonly see with uh, people who do this kind of analysis, value area low, value area high, and point of control. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But these levels on these particular charts, the way I have them set up, is to contain 70% of all trading that occurred. Now this 70% level, you'd also learn this in a statistics 101 course, is, well, 66% is one standard deviation contains about 67% or so of all cases. And then if, as you go out to the higher part of that distribution I drew on there a minute ago, uh, you get into the second standard deviation. Uh, that holds another, uh, I think, 30% uh, or so. And then the last one is about 90% of all the cases uh, for that particular distribution. So if we go to this, uh, there are coral uh, lines below, coral below uh, and blue above, and what that's showing is is the price, the value area for this particular day for the 17th, these two right here. And then this line in the middle is the point of control, and the point of control is where the most volume was for that day. Sometimes you'll see point of control called the POC. And so that is considered to be fair value uh, for that particular day, that point of control. And the zone in between is uh, considered to be the value area. And so uh, I'll get in uh, into more in a minute on uh, uh, how we use this. Uh, in between the value area high and value area low is another line called the point of control. And the point of control is the level at which the most trading took place on a chart for the relevant interval. And in most cases, the POC is an area where there is or has been some agreement about pricing. And this may also be called a high volume node, HVN, and, um, which just means that's the highest point. Uh, there are also areas of low volume, and these are areas where there is no consensus about pricing. And this may be called a low volume node. Let's see if, uh, well, well, we'll get to the low volume and high volume nodes in a little bit, um, uh, because this is really this concept here, high volume and low volume, is really the key of, of, of what I want to show you today in this presentation, because it's really comes it, it's really everything. But we'll get to that in a minute. Prices tend to move between areas of high volume agreement and low volume disagreement. Again, I'll reiterate, the high volume was where the majority of that art auction crowd agreed that pricing was fair, and that represents value. And so that's the high volume. The low volume, where that last guy traded, the high of the day, uh, that, was, that represents disagreement. Prices will tend to move with little resistance through areas of low volume and with resistance in areas of high volume. This is a very important concept because it can tell you if a breakout is valid or not. If I have a breakout setting up on a chart, and I know on my profile that there's nothing but low volume behind it, then I know that price can very freely and very quickly move through that region. And so I will try to trade in areas of breakouts into low volume because I want that price to move like crazy away from my entry. And so uh, we'll get into more detail about this as, as we go forward. I want to continue, and I don't, don't want to get too far behind the curve here on the timing. So, uh, Auction price movement. In areas of high volume, prices will tend to congest or consolidate, and we can make predictions about price action based on the analysis of these areas. Let's take a look. 
here we have a composite, and this is actually very close to what I have on my screen today, um, but uh, uh, it's changed a little bit. But what we have here essentially is, uh, if, if I look at this, we came up into this high volume, uh, we we're up in this high volume node right here. And then note, note what we did through this low volume region right here, we gap, boom. So overnight it just, and then it opens up in higher volume. So it goes from high volume to high volume, just overnight, boom, right there. You can see this uh, high bump here. Uh, and then it drifts around in this high volume area, because high volume is a, a price attractor. And then uh, we come into this next day, and we start seeking uh, value other, uh, elsewhere. We probably had a report on this day. Uh, I don't remember that far back. And what do we do? We seek through and we find the almost the very lowest volume area on the whole uh, volume chart here. We come down into here, the lowest volume area, and then we come back up and we seek back into uh, uh, high value again. And so um, this is uh, the principle, is that you move towards high volume, and you tend to get rejection in low volume where there is not agreement about price. Uh, what makes markets consolidate or trend? When a market is in consolidation or high volume, it's in agreement about valuation and is often waiting for new information before shifting modes. When a market is in a trend, there is not agreement about valuation, so it seeks new pricing and new value. And so discerning these uh, environments is a big part for me of trading profitably, is discerning where these volume areas are and what the market is likely to do as it enters into these areas or is rejected by these areas. Rejected or accepted, depending on high or low volume. Uh, and for this reason, I, you know, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, I was in real estate. They said, location, location, location. You're going to be a real estate investor. Location, location, location. And so uh, I say for trading, context, context, context. It's the same thing. When we can establish the context of the market, we know if it's likely to trend or move to new areas. And we can then turn this into an actionable plan. And this is kind of, I always want to know the context I'm trading in in advance. So as the day unfolds, uh, I, I know already, because I've already done the homework, I, I already know what is likely in the play. And I, and I, uh, I noticed that Mike, uh, at the beginning of this presentation, it was very appropriate. He had a dollar sign uh, on the on the front of the presentation that that wasn't part of my my PowerPoint presentation, which looks really boring. But he had this really nice looking graphic on there. It was a it was a dollar sign that was cut into a puzzle. And trading is very much like this. You uh, it's it's like solving a puzzle. And so when you know where these areas of high and low volume are and what the price action is doing, and then you can see the news reports, whether or not they, they're meeting or beating expectations. Uh, you can often paint a very clear picture of what is likely to happen. And then it's just a matter of getting a position on uh, with a manageable stock for the reward you think you might uh, be working with. And so uh, price versus value, what's the most important price of the day? I always like to ask this. And the answer is it's the open. The first question I'm asking myself each morning when I come in the office is, are we opening in or out of value? I do a, uh, I have a little uh, uh, a YouTube channel that I started uh, where I discuss the overnight price action and I, um, and I talk about where we are with respect to this whole value equation. And that's actually what I'm trying to do with this uh, presentation is to teach you so you can do this yourself. And actually the YouTube channel was intended to do that too, to teach how to uh, do this uh, overnight analysis with respect to this these volume areas. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, the simplest form of value analysis occurs at the open because you can easily tell if there's a change in sentiment or value. And so if we're gapping away, uh, there's obviously been some sort of change overnight uh, in the perceived value because we have moved away from volume. And, uh, and uh, similarly, we could be uh, opening inside range like we did this morning, and then you get a range trading day. We'll talk about that in a minute. 
value rules. If the market opens inside value, there is agreement about pricing and the market is more likely to range. And like I said, that's exactly what happened this morning. If the market opens above value, it is bullish and I will look to buy retracements lower. So if it comes down lower, I'm going to look to buy because the market opened above value, it told me that uh, there's a change in perceived value and if it retraces a little bit, I'll try and find a low risk entry in that. The ones I'm giving you here are textbook kinds of uh, strategies. I'm giving you the, the basics and uh, of course there's failures and you know anything can happen but this is the basic context that you impose uh, because when you create a context you have now a basis for learning. If you don't really have a context you're just kind of out there in, in no man's land and that's really the biggest single reason that I do this sort of analysis every single day is because it gives me a context from which to learn more about the market. And so, uh, continuing, if the market opens below value, it is bearish and I will look to sell retracements. And if the market opens outside of yesterday's range, higher or lower, it's out of value, out of range, uh, this is even stronger. This slide right here, excuse me, is the very core of a, uh, of a I call it the daily value report and value area report. And it's this slide right here is the very structure of that. And I will show you where you can um, where you can uh, view that each day in a little while. Uh, it's just something I put out on the internet. Uh, buy sell areas. If we open above value, then look to buy the value area high or the point of control. So this is the uh, retracement. So instead of using something like a moving average or something, I'm going to buy at a return to value. If we open above value, I'm going to I'm going to try to buy at a return to value. Either a return to the highest level of reasonable value, the value area high, or the point of control, which is the most agreed upon area of value. If we open below value, then look to sell the value area low or the point of control. So we're below it. I'm going to look to sell the most likely agreed upon value from the previous day or uh, the lesser of that, the value area low. But I'm going to look for it to touch that value area. And then within that larger context of that trading plan that I'm presenting on these last two slides, I want to know exactly what's going on with the news. I don't necessarily need to know what the news was, but knowing the time that the news is coming out and seeing the reaction to it within this framework of this larger context of the value area. And so um, uh, I'll, I'll get to that. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time uh, at the end of the presentation and I will talk about uh, uh, the recent price action today and yesterday, for example, if, if we have time. Uh, here's a slide. Um, sometimes I forget uh, how I made these, but essentially uh, what we had here on this day, this is the value area from that previous day. Notice that day was very narrow, a very narrow, uh, two days in a row, a very narrow price action. That was the fourth, so that gave you a really narrow one. But you have a very narrow uh, uh, value area here, and then what happens is the price departs away from it and trades lower. This is a textbook uh, kind of a scenario. On this particular day, it looks like we opened in value, and then we did a strange thing. We just ranged uh, back and forth all day, and uh, although we did it outside of value, but it was a very tight range. We've had very tight ranges lately, it's made trading difficult. Um, uh, let me see. I have another one here. Uh, here's another one where you open below value and you just head south all day. Uh, this one you open in value. Typically, you would uh, you would uh, range inside of a day like that, inside of the uh, inside of the value area. But very often later in the afternoon, you'll break a little lower. Um, uh, here's a day where you open in value and you just range all day. Uh, this one you open below and it ranges. Sometimes when you gap, you just don't have the gusto. It gaps 
below value, below range, and you get some downside, and then it just decides to sit sideways all day. So you have to deal with each one of these cases because it doesn't always do what it's supposed to do. And so that's why you kind of watch what's going on and try to bring other information into this contextual equation that we've been talking about. Uh, on a more advanced basis, volume profile value analysis can get much more advanced. Uh, let's look at a couple other forms of analysis. Uh, shapes. Um, I always like to think of myself, I, years and years and years ago, I owned a restaurant and uh, I studied with a French chef. And, uh, and when I finally couldn't afford to work for him anymore, I opened my own restaurant and um, I took all of this high-end French style uh, cuisine and I reduced all of it to a process. It was kind of like McDonald's. That's what they've done. They've reduced everything they do down to the, the simplest steps so that they can show anybody how to do it. And it's duplicable anywhere. You have McDonald's opening all over Asia right now, for example. Very successful. Um, don't get me talking about McDonald's. It's, they've paid a dividend for I think 34 years. Every year they raise their dividend for 34 years. Um, I always reduce the theory to a simple to understand concept. And when you're able to get through the logic, this also happens when you write computer programs for trading things. You, you have to get down to the very specific logic that, that's making it work. And then you know when it's doing it or not doing it because you know the specific rules. It's not a fuzzy kind of idea in there. And so uh, I had mentioned earlier there's a lot of cultism to auction theory circles. And uh, like I said, it's really just statistics 101 applied to markets. And so uh, they'll go on and on and on about it. And you read a 500-page book, and you know it can really be reduced to a couple of sentences. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do for you here, I'm just reducing these things down to the simplest terms. And that's where we get into the shapes here. Um, there are four basic shapes that you can have in a profile. Of course, you could come up with more of them if you want to, because it's you know, it's kind of continuous function. Some days it's kind of fuzzy what the, what the shapes are. But by and large, there are four basic shapes. You have a capital D, a little b, a P, and a big B. A D shape is what I was talking about in the beginning. We talked about a bell curve distribution. It's a normal statistical distribution when you have that, and it's evenly uh, distributed. And I think, you know, if I go back a couple of slides, uh, you know, that was um, uh, this day here. Uh, for example, would have been, the, I guess, the fifth, or the day the sixth. Those are normal distributions. It's just D-shaped. And so uh, the next shape, uh, wait, let's see what else I had here. D-shapes are associated with consolidation and the building of value in a region on your chart. Breakouts occur from Ds. Now, the reason that breakouts occur from Ds, Ds represent value, highly agreed upon value. And so usually for price to leave that, that high volume area, there has to be a change in perceived value of a, a large number of participants. Because otherwise, it wouldn't leave. They'd fade it when it hit the extremes of the D. And when they don't fade it and it breaks higher or lower, uh, that tells you there's a change in perceived value. And if you come into that with some volume analysis, it can tell you how much gusto is behind it. And so. Uh, so I asked the question, did you see any Ds in the last chart? And I went back and I cheated it for you, and we, we spotted a, a D there. Uh, the next shape is a B. And you get a B shape typically when the market sells off and then consolidates. And this is associated with long liquidation. Uh, basically, what you have is you have a sell-off, and uh, then the market will consolidate in a range, and it will form somewhat of a B. Uh, let me see if I can find one of those on that chart. Uh, not really seeing one there. We have a P there. Uh, I probably have one for you uh, up ahead. Uh, protracted sell-offs often begin with long liquidation that is followed by new sellers entering to follow it up. And so if you do not get this, and usually you don't, then the market will retrace the B. And so Bs, textbook answer, Bs are most often retraced. And so let me talk about that a little more in depth because I don't want to just blast over that that subject because this is also very key. Most reversals in price start 
with, if you sell down, for example, this starts with short covering. It's the shorts getting out of their positions. They go, holy moly, it's turning around. I'm getting out. You know, I don't want to go back to a break even on this trade, right? And so that will propel uh, the market uh, higher in this particular example. Of, and so what happens is uh, one of two things. Either the short, uh, the shorts uh, covering will be followed by new longs propelling the market higher, or it will get faded and uh, new shorts will enter again. Um, but almost invariably, a move begins with either short covering or long liquidation. And so you want to discern between, this is, this is a, a discerning between old money and new money. Old money is the already existing shorts, or the, in the example that we're using here, and new money is new positions being established. And uh, I think we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go on. Uh, the next shape is a P, and you typically get a P shape when the market rallies and then consolidates. This is opposite to what we just discussed with the B. This is associated with short covering. And protracted rallies often begin with short covering that is followed by new buyers. I might have just told you that other one backwards, but uh, I think you get the idea. Protracted rallies often begin with short covering that is following new buyers, entering, following it up. But you don't usually get this uh, follow-up um, because markets are counter-trend oriented. So uh, what will happen is uh, you'll come up to the P, you'll consolidate a little bit, and then you'll get retraced. So P's are most often reshaped when you see that shape of a distribution on your, uh, on your distribution uh, software, whatever you happen to be using. Um, so sometimes you'll get P's or B's that are backwards. You'll get consolidation followed by the move instead of the other way around. And uh, I'm, I don't want to launch into a long discussion of that, but I'm just opening up your thinking about what, uh, how different shapes might actually have different uh, kinds of patterning behind them. So going deeper into the kind of thinking. And you will do well to notice when this is occurring. Um, I'm not going to cover that in this lecture, though. Uh, sometimes the move is a gap followed by a consolidation, and then you get a P or a B. But it's missing the volume area, uh, the, uh, the stem of the P or the B, because it happened overnight. And so that's another pattern that is uh, good to know. So very often gaps are uh, examples of this. You look for clusters of volume following a gap that is followed by a reversal. I think we saw something like that this morning. Uh, the B shape, capital B, is associated with continuation. And this is our double distribution. It's kind of like a D with a little uh, punch right in the middle of it. And so uh, it's like putting two Ds together, one over the other. And so I mentioned that again. This is another way of expanding your thinking, because everything can really be reduced to a D in some form or another. It's a D with a stem, or it's two Ds. You know, so everything reduces to the D, right? And what's a D? It's a normal distribution. It's agreed upon uh, pricing. And so what happens is the market tries to find value, followed by a move that's going to look like a bull or a bear flag, and then it's going to cons consolidate again. Sometimes you'll have days that look like a rally day. The mark, you know, the S and P will move 20 points, and you'll see three, essentially three Ds on there. Uh, on the distribution for the day. And the reason for that is you get, it shoots up, it flags out, forms a D, shoots up again, flags out, forms another D, shoots up again, flags out, forms another D, and then there's no time left in the day and you end up with a triple distribution. Um, I very rarely would see that go to four inside of a day. Um, but sometimes you'll see this. And uh, this is an intraday making of the other more basic patterns or shapes so there are less than one day profiles. So you could, I know some people developing software that enables you to see uh, these distributions uh, inside of any box that you make on your chart. I had thought about doing this at one time, but then I came up with some other tools that made it simpler for me. Uh, there are really only two, uh, two or one shape, the Ds, and price movements. And everything else can be analyzed from this viewpoint. So this goes hand in hand with the saying, calm before the storm. Uh, the D is the calm, and then the storm is when you leave that uh, region. 
And as I said, if there's a if a D is agreed upon price, and you come to the extremity of the D, uh, you're most likely to get pushed back down into the center of that D, which is, as we discussed initially, the point of control. And um, in a lot of ways, the market is like uh, you know Newton's theory of motion. You know, once you set it in motion, it'll continue moving. And then when it hits these areas, people will go, well, wait a minute, it's not worth that anymore. And they'll start getting more and more people agreeing that it should go back the other way. And then, then you get a pivot. And so uh, markets tend to move, as mentioned, from areas of value through areas of no value quickly. And you see how that reduces. I just described going from D to D to D. And uh, when we get these quick movements, we call them uh, single prints. This is where you just get uh, one bar going up, and then it, and then it clusters. And uh, by the way, when you get that one bar going up, that's low volume, right? And so it can move back through those uh, relatively quickly uh, very often. That can be a trap, bull trap or bear trap. Uh, single prints are when the market moves through an area quickly and leaves a thin profile. Remember, areas of low volume should provide rejection and areas of high volume acceptance. You could even call uh, a high volume area a magnet, and a low volume area is a, a, a detractor or something that pushes price away. Uh, value area relationships. You then get into value area from uh, one day to the next can be higher or lower or overlapping. And in the reports that I do daily that I'll show you uh, what site those are on, um, I talk about that inside the report. Because this can be used as a trend indicator. If you have value areas going progressively higher, sometimes they even gap away like they did yesterday. They gap, the whole value area is gapped away uh, from the previous day. They can also be narrower or wider. And so uh, when you have a really narrow distribution, you, you know, if you get a D and it's really narrow, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about uh, consolidation that's very tight. And you break out from those ranges more easily than you do a wider one. In fact, when you get wider areas, it tends to be more of a market that's ranging and just freely auctioning, and you get these wide value areas, and so, um, and so you get that uh, kind of a tendency. And uh, I don't think I really talk about that much more, but I do talk about it in the report, and, and that, like I said, that's the learning aid that continues after this webinar, which is kind of cool. Um, composites. So far we've been looking at value on a day-by-day -day basis. We can discern a bigger picture by making composites. Composites are when we join multiple days of volume into one profile. So this makes it easier to see the high volume and the low volume nodes that we talked about initially that can be attractors or detractors as the case may be of price to action. And uh, this is an example of a composite. And uh, as I had mentioned, uh, I, this this might be the same chart. Yeah, we gap through this low volume area. We open that day uh, into higher vol uh, area, and then we take our time kind of drifting through that for a couple of days. We make our way lower. We test into a low volume node, and then we come back up uh, right into that value area again. So this is kind of a, uh, uh, what we have a, a stem and a B here, and then it breaks lower, another stem and a little bit of a B. And then we finally retrace. That one, of course, failed. Um, but I mentioned, you know, you kind of need to know what's going on with the news with, with uh, all this stuff. You know, 10 years ago, I would have said, oh, I never look at news. And then nowadays, the whole economy is driven by the government. And so you really kind of need to know what's going on on the news front, particularly scheduled government reports. Composites are great for doing support and resistance work that provide a larger contextualization of market action. And we always want to trade on a level lower than our lowest level of analysis. This is an interesting principle. We always want to trade on a lower level than our lowest level of analysis. So I want to be trading you know, three-minute charts when I'm doing analysis on day charts, for example. That's, I'm just throwing that out there, not necessarily any magic there, but uh, composites are part of this. So I always know what's going on. I always have a composite on my screen because it reminds me of where I am in a bigger picture. 
one of the problems that we get into as intraday traders is we get so caught up in the minutia, you, know, you, you find yourself trading on a on a three minute chart intraday and and the, the range over the last hour has been one point. And you're in there trying to take something out of it. And geez, what a formula for getting eaten up, you know, as many of you may be not in your heads. Uh, so I keep these uh, shots on my screen to kind of remind me of what these ranges are and everything else because I tend to, for just my own personal trading, I tend to trade very tight, very quick. I want action now and I want out. And so um, that's just my personality. And so others are more patient and can get in a trend trade. You know, they like yesterday could pick up, you know, 15, 20 points. That will never happen to me. Uh, at least not the way I trade right now. You know, I, I see it, but I don't do it because uh, I can't stand to sit there. I want to be done by 8.30 in the morning my time. I start trading at 6.30. So, uh, you know, as I get older, I don't have the energy and other things. So you find what works for you within these uh, contexts. So you're trading, you know, you're looking at 30-minute charts. I even have 720-minute uh, charts I look at. 1,440 is a whole day, 720. 360, then I go to 250, 50-minute 50 chart, 25, 10-minute uh, charts, 5-minute charts, 2-minute charts. And so uh, I have ways of reducing that all down on one screen, but, uh, you know, trying to keep myself in that larger context so I don't do stupid stuff, you know. Uh, okay, what did you notice from the composite? First off, you should have immediately noticed the high and low volume areas. And then did you see we had formed some value at or about the current level? And uh, let, me, let me see what that might have been. Yeah, we're forming value uh, in this current level. This is the high volume node on the chart, but this is a secondary one for sure. And we've definitely, over the last number of days, been working on that uh, region. I think then uh, we broke. We're at 766 now, so we're actually back. We came back down and visited this high volume area, and then we bounced off of that yesterday at the low. We actually came uh, right down through this high volume a little bit, and then we bounced back up. I apologize that that wasn't a bit more current, but we had some time uh, getting the webinar prepared for you, et cetera. So, um, and so uh, these numbers are probably not going to be right, but I think we've kind of covered that. Uh, here you can see on this particular composite, and I, this is from uh, a number of months ago, you know, we get all this clustering in the high volume area. We came, to, came down very quickly through that low volume area, and then we uh, clustered at the high volume area, and then, bam, we go really quickly through the uh, low volume area again. So when I'm trading intraday, I'm asking myself the same question. We were looking at this on, you know, multi-day uh, scale, we're looking at it on day scale. I'm asking myself intraday as the price is clustering after uh, making a move or something, uh, whether or not I have low volume, uh, you know, if we came up into the cluster area, I'm asking myself if we have low volume below it that we can quickly move through. Because when that breaks, I want to be in that uh, trade uh, where it has the potential for moving quickly. Otherwise, it clusters there and um, and uh, you don't get the uh, movement. So um, I have a blog, markettradersjournal.com, and I do this value area report on there each day for you. And the reason I put that there is as a learning tool, because it covers everything that we're, uh, that we're talking about here. I talk about the shape. I talk about the width. I talk about whether it's going higher or lower, whether the value areas are trending. I talk about what the value areas are. I talk about things such as virgin points of control, which we didn't talk about in this webinar. A virgin point of control is kind of like a gap. It's a point of control where the price departed from it. And very often, these are magnet prices later on. And uh, the price will move back into that. And so there are many articles. Over the last eight months, I've probably written 50 articles on all different kinds of topics on that blog. And um, I've really poured a lot of my heart and soul into it. And uh, there's a, just a crazy, I, I went on vacation a few weeks ago and I came back and I just could, couldn't even begin to muster the kind of energy that I was putting into it before um, I, 
I may be able to you know come back to that level but uh, I was writing uh, pretty much every day and uh, different things and working on different uh, subjects but they're, they're there for your uh, reading and it covers a broad overview of uh, using different kinds of volume techniques and uh, and auction uh, techniques and so um, uh, so you can read the articles there's more there on this uh, same actually quite a bit because this is this has really uh, been a, a big topic for me what we're what this webinar is on and so there's a lot more material there uh, talking about little nuances and, and uh, whatnot of uh, using this I think in a lot of ways it's easy to get trapped into over analysis and that's why I talked about that at the beginning this stuff really shouldn't be that complicated. For me, I've devoted my life to coding systems and analyzing things and writing things about it. And for somebody just coming into this and learning these things in the simplest possible way, like I try to present, then you you don't carry all this extra baggage that when you're uh, entering a trade uh, that you carry with you. And so there's really a lot of advantages to uh, coming into this fairly fresh and having somebody to have uh, gone over uh, some of this with you. But I see uh, there are some uh, followings of this sort of thing that just get, I mean, it almost gets like, you know, religious kind of uh, appeal to it. And I try to not uh, hit it at that level, so just try to turn it into the statistical thing that it is. I have a background in experimental design and statistics so it's natural for me when I first saw this I was like well wait this is just statistics in uh, applied statistics so um, so after reading and studying um, uh, on the blog or uh, going over this uh, webinar Mike's recording this which is really nice um, uh, if you have any questions by all means ask me I uh, uh, put a forum on the blog there and so if you have any specific questions or you can ask it within uh, mics, we'll try and uh, get some uh, answers yeah. uh, on there for you if you post there. I also have a Twitter feed, and uh, I post some of these things on that during the day. I, I have that kind of automated. We have and a lot so of... that's what I have. Great. We have a lot of questions uh, coming okay. in as well. Okay. I hope uh, I haven't gone too much. It's come in a uh, pretty good time. So, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And, Mike, I think you were going to read them? or Yeah, I will. So, uh, okay. uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Uh, if anybody has questions, go ahead and start typing them. I'm going to ask several of my own and uh, also go back and ask what people have been asking uh, as you've been presenting. So, first okay. of all, um, I wanted to clarify, you seem to be focusing solely on volume profile. What about market profile and TPOs? Do you, how do you um, distinguish or what, what is your opinion of the you know, value area that's generated off of TPOs on market profile versus the value area on just volume profile? Yeah, the TPOs are good, but I, uh, I found that the, just from my own personal experience, that the volume is really more... Uh, it's more true for me. Um, but I also will say this, Mike, and this is why I, you know, after coding systems for a million years and, and uh, getting into the computer code and everything, I, in another way, I look at it and I, and I understand this is just a statistical profiling technique. And so those, the TPO uh, measure will often be very coincidental with the volume profile. Sometimes they vary a bit, uh, but by and large, the volume is really the actual trading that occurred, whereas the TPOs are uh, time at price. So if it clusters in a region for quite a bit of time, you'll get a lot of accumulation there, and you'll get a similar profile, but very often the volume and the time uh, end up being the same. And so uh, I've just, uh, for whatever reason, settled on volume. And I noticed that you make extensive use of composite profiles. Uh, where, how are you establishing your start date? Are you looking at a swing high or low, or is your composite only what was on screen, or what are you using? Um, yeah, typically I will look first uh, from, uh, try to look through one cycle. Um, but I've even become 
pretty lax in the way I use that, and I might uh, pull up different numbers of days, but I try to have a minimum of one cycle on there. So uh, just looking at my Russell chart, I might try to go back at least to the 12th or so. What, what are you Where calling a cycle? On the 12th. You're calling it a swing high or low? Uh, yeah, essentially a, a sine wave. And so I, you, you start, you go down to a low, you come up to a high, and then you come back down. That that okay. So I try to have one full cycle uh, in there at a minimum. And your all of your profile now, uh, your volume analysis is based on daily volume. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's intraday volume, and then that gets compiled into the composites or the. And are you looking at only uh, regular trading hour cash? Or are you looking at global globex overnight? I, I do only look. I I actually trade the Russell. Because I like the ten tick structure, because um, it it uh, it's better for the kind of scalping that I do, but um, but uh, because the Russell's really spotty at really spotty at night, um, I trade I uh, do my uh, composites just on the day data, and um, I would probably I would I I might well I used to run. Before I kind of went fully to the Russell, I did use some overnight data. I would run both uh, overnight charts and day charts on the uh, on the ES. Okay, and just going back for just a moment to the composite. So, did I understand right that you're only looking at, let's say, on average, maybe two weeks at a time? Um, yeah, maybe a couple weeks, but I will do longer term. I have uh, profiles. I'll put up a 405 minute chart. And I'll do a profile going back over a year, particularly when we get to the extremes. And I, I didn't actually talk about this subject, but what happens with these profiles is when you start getting near all, you know, a, a year high or a year low or something like this, you really don't have any profile to work with unless you want to go back like five years. Well, you know, you're going through, you know, eight contract roles. And you're compiling data from different contracts, and then, you know, I I see because I see guys using, you know, making composites that go back years, and I have to, as a statistician, I have to seriously question the validity of pulling data from, you know, three contracts ago, four or five contracts ago, right? And so I a composite out of it, but but you you, I'm sorry, just one other thing, the uh, but you. If this is the way you trade, you have to do something, right? So you use what you got. Right. I, I do trade this way, by the way. Yeah, so if, if you don't, if you're at the extremes of price, yeah. That's why I have all these questions for you. So I, I'm one of the people that use quite often a a, a multi-year composite. I use IQ fee with back adjusted data. Yeah. And uh, so it you know it back adjusts the the price that's shown on my screen. Is not the price that it actually traded at, but it is relative to the back adjustment for the contracts, so that the levels yeah. stay relative. Exactly, and and those levels are particular. So you use like RT or I use I RT. No, I use Sierra chart. Oh, okay, um, those those uh, as, as you get to the extremes of the range over the last n contracts or so, um, there's really no alternative. And sometimes right. when we break, you know, higher as we did, oh, number of months ago, it was back in, uh, well, even, uh, you know, uh, so July, uh, that's strange. Even the beginning of this month, we had broken higher for a while there. Uh, we had a big rally around just around the 4th or so. You know, and then you have to start looking back, you know, six or eight months on your profile to pull some data. There have been cases like in the beginning of 2012, uh, where you had to pull, you would have had to pull back going uh, going back, uh, probably uh, close to two years in right. order to get anything. Yeah. So yeah. One, one more thing on on that, since it's relevant, um, what what is your thought process on using tick data, one tick resolution to build a composite? Uh, you know, a lot of people don't have access to multiple years of tick data uh, versus using one minute. What What is your opinion? Um, well, I, I, uh, you know, I'm a purist in many ways, <laughs> but then I start realizing 
it's it's just a statistical profile, you know. And so, uh, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, um, though I respect and honor doing it doing it right because that's the right way to do it. Uh, I don't know that you really get, you know, it's like the, you know, the law of diminishing returns. You know, you're putting a lot of effort into uh, something that may not actually be an advantage. Right. And so that's what I also talked at the beginning about the whole intuitive thing because the trading, it really comes down to kind of analyzing what's happening in the picture and and often that could just be something as simple as how fast the ticks are occurring on your screen or something, some something that you don't even know that you're doing, you know. And so, right. uh, but I agree that like the way Gomi has done it on your site, I, you know, I've looked at uh, his stuff and uh, it, it's great. You know, it's great, and those ladders and everything that that's on there. I, the they he did it right with the recorder and all that kind of stuff. So let me. Um, that's that's. Okay, so before we we start talking about footprint, <laughs> let me let me uh, uh, go back and I noticed you didn't mention anything to do with initial balance. Do you use the one hour initial balance in any of your trading? Um, I do. Um, I have it pop up on my screen at 7.30 my time. Uh, that would be 10.30 your time. And essentially I'm using that in a similar way to the, to the way I use the profiles. I just didn't talk about it because it's not really volume based. It's just range based over the first hour. But And then I keep on my uh, screen, uh, I've coded some things up. I have uh, average daily range. Um, I have range today. I have initial balance range today, initial balance uh, range uh, average five days, average ten days. So I can see if it's expanding or contracting. Uh, like today uh, on the Russell, we had a, a IBP range of 7.9, and that's a bit larger than average. And usually when I see that bigger range, I'm going to expect that we're going to be ranging more uh, as opposed to getting a consolidated, you know, my average five-day right. uh, IDP is uh, 6.8 and I get 3.6, I'm going to be looking for a breakout. So let me yeah. let me ask some uh, some more specific questions. Let's say that, okay, before I ask this, I need to define something. So do you look at balance and imbalance? And uh, like I typically find that the market will balance itself for, you know, say two or three days. I, I primarily, primarily trade the Yes, and then once we uh, leave that consolidation area, that balance area, we will trend for maybe you know two days. So I tend to group uh, profiles, uh, build a, a uh, micro composite profile across you know the areas where it was balanced, and I look to see if we open up outside of that value. And I, mean, yeah. I heard that you say you know opening out of value. What are you using to define value? Are you using it just the prior day, or are you looking at you know, two or three days that are imbalanced. Yeah, you're you're actually giving me goosebumps, Mike, because this what you just described is a really if you have the patience. Yeah, you know, I'm like a bit of an adrenaline junkie or something, but what I look for, what I like to see, is exactly what you described: a couple days of D distributions, and and if those if that second D is inside the first one. That's even better, you know. Of course, a lot of times when these scenarios that you described occur, it actually the action occurs overnight, you know. And then you're like, well, I don't want to sell, you know, 14 handles lower off the open. <laughs> you know, I don't have right, the right. intestinal fortitude to do that. But well, that actually, uh, I will look. I've actually, I'm sorry. I've actually learned. I look at the. I look at my. Uh, at my profile charts, not just as individual days. Like, for example, the one I'm looking at today, we have an inside day today. We have a, a very peaky type of a D distribution that is inside yesterday's kind of B-ish uh, shape. And, but we're even kind of down into the D part of that B-ish shape from yesterday. We couldn't really get up. Uh, above the value area uh, uh, high uh, from yesterday. And so uh, we really kind of have, if I omit the stem of that B from yesterday, I have an inside D 
inside double D. And so this is exactly what I'm looking at at my chart here is, is, is pretty much what you just described. You know, even though yesterday was not a consolidation day, actually the latter part of the day was. And right. so, but I'm discerning that just by looking at my profile chart and not, not, uh, not trying to use any software to do it. I'm just looking right. at it and saying, hmm, you know, uh, you know, Monday afternoon, though it pushed lower, it, it, it went and it caught this, uh, I'm looking at the Russell, by the way, but, um, oh, we came down and we touched this high volume node on the composite. We actually went through it a little bit, and then we came back up, but it was also a virgin point of control from quite a while ago. And then it bounced back off of that and consolidated. And then we consolidated today. So, like, if I see us going on the Russell tomorrow, you know, much above, we have a pretty tight value area today. So if I see us, you know, blasting through 768 half on any kind of volume or something, I'm going to look to catch something going long tomorrow. You know, so depending on the report, so I keep right. I like the forex forex uh, site for the I forget which one it is. Forex Factory has a, has a good news calendar. Yeah, they got it. Yeah, I really like theirs because it you can learn what the reports are about. It describes each one and it tells how it's computed and right. And, uh, yeah. So let let me go back to the to the second part of the, of the question. So if you if you define value and kind of like a micro composite of when the market is balanced versus unbalanced. Let's say that for the last three days we've been balanced and today we open up outside of value to the long side. What is your thought process? Are you biased towards longs? Are you are you a counter trend, you know, main reversion kind of guy? What what's going through your head on a on a scenario like this where we've been imbalanced, today we opened up outside of value. What do you do? Yeah if if we've been consolidating for a day and a half, as in this conversation that we're having, and we break higher on the open, we break out of value on the open, I'm going to try to bias myself as a trend trader, at least initially. Okay. And I'll want to see some volume with that. Okay. Um, but. And I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I think that that's one of the hardest things that I've found people have trouble doing is because they, they feel like, um, it should revert back, and it's, and, it, and they yeah. they seem to discount or disregard that there are trending days. While they're not as often as their you know balance days or, or range bound days, yeah. they do happen. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really impossible. <laughs> it's you know, there's no other word for it than damned if you do and damned if you don't. And nothing's worse than fading a rally day. So you just get killed, 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 right. killed. So that brings me. Time that you would have made a ton of money on the trade. Yeah, that brings me to the next question, and and that's actually a good point. You know, I see people get killed on rain on tight range days, because they're they're trading the extremes and they're they seem to be caught in the wrong direction every single time. And then I yeah. see people get killed on trend days because they were just trying to counter trend it the entire day, and that it's never they they never made a single trade in the right direction. So, yeah. you you've got to have the right uh, tools for both kinds of days. So I noticed that on your charts, it, it seems that you don't use what I call extensions. So you're not extending like a, a naked extension of the value area or a naked extension of the point of control. Um, uh, I, I typically use those as support and resistance. Do you not do that? Are you using a multiple of the value area range? Yeah, I, I take the value area high and low, and I will extend those lines forward until price yeah. hits that again. And if it doesn't yeah. hit it, then it remains on my chart until it does. Same thing with the point yeah. control. I actually do that with the IBP. I use multiples of IBP, uh, but I, I've never done that. Okay, with, not uh, the sorry, area. sorry, not not multiples. Uh, I'm talking about, let's say that uh, you know today we have the value area high. I will extend that line forward. And it will remain on my chart. That line will stay on my chart forward. It's an extension until price returns to that level. Once price trades at that level, the line will be taken out. Oh, okay. I do that with virgin points. Right, yeah. Virgin point of control is another way to describe it. Yeah, and I had my guys code it so that it'll keep the line on there indefinitely until it gets hit. Okay. So we're talking about we're talking about the same thing. So you do yeah, we you are. do that. We are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and, so and those are those are extremely important areas. I didn't spend a lot of time on that in the webinar, but 
Uh, virgin points of control are huge. So then this, this goes to the next... Uh, particularly where they're piling up. Yeah, okay. Sorry, this goes to the next question. So if you have these lines in your chart, my question is, how are you trading them? I, I'm trying to get a sense for, do you, uh, you know, long... Let's, let's go back to that scenario where we've been balanced, now we open outside of value uh, to, the, to the upside, so you're, you're positioned, you know, you're thinking long. Do you uh, long and look for, you know, the next area of resistance maybe as a prior value area low or a prior point of control? Do you trade that or do you put your trades in ahead of time to counter trend off of that move that you might be expecting for the, the market to bounce back? Um, for my personal trading, what I'm really doing, I, I, I more or less depart from all of this when it comes to the actual trading. So, and, but let me clarify that. It's not because it doesn't uh, work because I've spent untold numbers of hours sitting here watching this stuff all day long forever. But because my, my personal trading is much shorter in its duration, and so I'm really using all this as a much larger context. And so I come to the conviction that the market's doing you know, such and such, it's going higher or it's going lower. And then I try to look for my, uh, my little breakout scenario within that on a very, very tight stop, usually about a point. There's a one point stop, and which a lot of times I kick myself for because it's probably too tight sometimes, but I trade more size and so it just manages to work for me. But I believe that uh, if you have the patience to trade uh, longer like that, that that is a very valid approach. And there are certainly enough people doing it that it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy to price movement. And, and you can be with that group that's doing that. Because we know that big money trades this. Right. You know. Yeah. OK. Um. I see several questions that we're talking about uh, the composite profiles. So I think that in your presentation that you mentioned that uh, high volume composite or high volume node uh, is like a magnet. Price is drawn to it because there's a greater agreement of value. Am I right? Right. Okay. And then you're saying that low volume almost acts as the exact opposite because there was there was no agreement. There was uh, uh, the opposite. <laughs> and yeah. So it has less less stopping power is probably a good way to put it. Okay, so you find that as price, let me ask you the, the question, let me set it up. If price, if we're in a trending day and we're trending towards a low volume node, what do you do? Do you, do you uh, pay it? How does that line in the sand come into play for you? Um, what I would do is I would look on my chart for a breakout kind of a scenario. And um, I would try to uh, trade a break into that region with a relatively tight stop in hopes that it would uh, have no stopping power. Okay, so you're looking for price to trade straight through it and keep going. Yeah, that's what I want. Okay. And I see a question. Sorry. I see questions okay. here about, uh, about the, the point of control. So let me just ask you. I don't want to give my opinion. I want to, get, I want to hear yours. Do, do you view point of control as a, I mean, let, uh, maybe I should reframe this. Let's say that we have yesterday's point of control on our chart for today. What does that line mean to you? Is that a resistance? Is it support? Is it an area price is drawn to? What is it? Yeah, if we were, if we had no, no reports today and we opened up inside of value, I would expect a revisit to the point of control. Um, even if we open like at the value area higher, value area low, I I'm going to expect to come uh, back and visit that point. Okay. So that's a that's again um, I expect that to be a magnet price. Okay. Uh, if we open out of value, uh, I'm going to expect that if we come to that point, we're going to uh, get if we opened above and we come back down to that. Uh, point of control, I'm going to expect that we're going to trade higher from there. Okay. I, I'm in complete agreement with you. So Yeah, so it'll act as support if it opens higher. It'll act as resistance if it opens lower. 
Right. Now, since you know the majority of our days are range days, do you? How do you? What's your play? What's your mentality? Are you looking to fade extremes? Uh, let's say that you see like a, a B or a P profile. Are you? Are you? Are you trying to fade it? Are you trying to do the opposite and build a position early in the day and hold for the extreme? What's your thought process? Yeah, um, I. You know, it's funny, Mike, because I was solely a counter trend trader for 15 years. I, I wouldn't do anything unless it was like a high or a low, you know, or pretty darn close to it. And um, recently, more recently, I almost have, you know, and I'm and I'm only saying this because you're asking the question and I'm reflecting, not because I'm have given it thought, but I've really become an intraday trend trader. But I'm catching a counter trend within that within that larger trend, and so right. um, I that that fills my need of being, you know, a, a, a deal shopper. You know. Well, what I find, and I'm just trying to get your your input so that you know not everyone is always listening to me all the time. But I find that a lot of people on the forum have a you know built-in tendency to counter trend, right? And they they see a market trading at an extreme or what they perceive to be an extreme and they they typically want to short it or they want to you know reverse away and they they were they're a reversion to the mean type of a trader. And what I find happens in a lot of those scenarios though is that uh, we'll end up with a P or a B shape curve and it, price will trade to the extreme and then it will sit there and consolidate for the rest of the day. And then uh -huh. very likely the next day will be the break outside of value and then the trend. So it doesn't work, you know. Now Yeah, you're always out of phase with what you need to be doing. Um, this is where, and I didn't discuss it in this webinar and maybe we'll do one in the future where we simply talk about uh, looking at what I call net ticks or the sum of net ticks because if you're at a if you're at a high for the day, like this morning on uh, on the open, for that first thirty minutes we didn't have any reports, and so what we did was we came up and we tested the Globex high. There was no new information in the system, and so we tested the Globex high. There was no new information in the system, and as I recall, the volume wasn't pushing any. Um, let me pull it up here so I know my – actually, we did get a good push, but by by uh, the time the report came out, the volume was actually breaking below it, where it was from the open, and the price was lower, too. So um, now I missed that, and I ended up taking two little scalps today and didn't do anything, but I, I also recognized that I was really kind of out of it today, and so I, I'll stop myself. Uh, from trading, if I feel that I'm out of it, because okay. on the open you got to be really sharp. Right. But but what I was getting at is, I'm contextualizing the the question. You come up to a to a new high, it's at the Globex high. There's no new information in the system, and the volume starts to fade. And so to me, uh, that's a that's a setup for a counter trend trade. Okay. So going back to what you said in your presentation, you said one of the very first things that you do is look to see if we've opened in or out of value, and I I do that as well. So what's the next step? What do you you know? I'm just trying to uh, have you walk us through a a day to where how how are you framing the market? How are you deciding, or do you decide it's it, today is likely to be a range day? Today is likely to be a trend day, and I'm, I have yeah. certain game plans for certain kinds of days. Yeah, I um, when we opened this morning. <clears throat> Um, we were opening inside a value following that range day from yesterday, and so I expected that we were going to range trade today. And um, but I also knew that we had a report coming out 30 minutes after, and that was actually a disappointing report. So um, that was a catalyst to push the market to test a low. But my my thought this morning was just quite simply this. We open in range, I expect range trading. You know, okay. we open out right. of range, I expect 
Um, now, yesterday morning, not today, but yesterday morning, we actually opened above value and then immediately traded right back through it and then headed south most of the day. Right. Uh, but there was also a negative report uh, that came out uh, 30 minutes after. I, well, actually, I don't remember which time that report was uh, right offhand. But we, were, we opened above value. We had a bad report. How often do you find that we open outside of value and we end up uh, consolidating back into the range? We fall backwards? Actually, you know, that's a great question because I think it happens way more often than the market auction people would like to admit. <laughs> right. You don't get the, you don't get, it, it just doesn't uh, hold up that well. So then you start talking about, uh, about looking at it in terms of failures. Like I said, yesterday we open above value, we have a bad report, we immediately go through the entire value area and head south the rest of the day. Right. So do, so you, have, a after, do you have a process of saying, you know, we, okay, today we've opened outside of value, but, you know, there's not a lot of strength here. Are you looking at initial balance to help you decide that we're likely to fall back? Yeah, I'm actually um, relying at that point on an intuitive process. And yesterday, I did catch, I, I, I kind of have to answer the question on a day-by-day -day basis because I'm really very intuitive at this point. I caught a short off of the open, and I picked up uh, four points on that yesterday. And then when it clustered in the third to fourth uh, half hour or so, um, let me see. Um, I made the mistake, because we were at the value area low, right? I made, that was about 8.30 my time, it's 11.30 your time approximately. I caught a long there, and I got taken out. And then I sold again, and uh, I made back what I had lost, and I decided I'm taking the rest of the day off. So, uh, but I, but that was my process yesterday. Right. So it's always, it's always where are we in terms of value and what are the reports doing? And, and what kind of expectation do I think that report has? Like, for example, today we didn't meet the new home sales uh, number. And I actually would have thought that would be much more bearish than, than, it, than it was. Right. So I'm kind of thinking down tomorrow. And someone, someone had, a, had, had uh, asked this question. They're talking about the 80% rule. And if I remember this correctly, it's something – along the lines where 80% of the time if we open outside of value, then it'll fill the, the value area or something, something like that. You know it's what? Been a while. I, <laughs> I, I, well, I wouldn't doubt, Mike, that that's probably pretty close. It'd be interesting to set up a test. I don't have software to give me that I can access those values and code it because I, I would run uh, – I would run uh, tests on on that sort of thing. Uh, years ago, I would have I wouldn't have been able to stop myself from coding that and testing it. But um, but right. I, I bet you're right, and that's exactly the opposite of what's you know supposedly going to be the case. So you know. So let me ask just a couple of uh, more generic questions, and then also if anybody has asked a question that I have not already answered, type it again, please. So here's just a couple of generic questions. Do you regarding your own personal trading and not necessarily regarding profile or volume. Do you always uh, have a certain risk reward in mind? Will, will you trade if the risk reward is is uh, not at least one to one? Do you look at those kinds of things before you trade? Uh, I, I do and I'm not as I, I, I've, re, I've reduced it to this Mike um, and I, I kind of chuckle at myself and I call it chicken you know, blank, 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 blank trading. <laughs> yeah. But uh, here's what I do. I found this works for me. It might not be for you, but this is this is what works for me. I I have my little way of finding my spots for entry. I have basically a one point stop. I trade either a three lot or a five lot in the Russell. Now the Russell can move a point as fa faster than you can click the darn buttons, you know, and so. What I do on the five lot is I immediately take either two or three of them off at about four or five ticks. And then I move my stop to, because I, I have this entry down. 
And so, and that's why I'm, maybe I, I don't mean to sound evasive in how I answer some of these questions, but I have it reduced to zero risk entry approach for Rob, you know. And so uh, I take those two or three off, depending on how much momentum I'm getting, and then I immediately move the remaining two or three to uh, what would be a break even or enough to pay for my commission or whatever. And then I try to let it ride. And okay. if I've got if I go, if I do a five three and leave two remaining, and we get to some sort of a, you know if we hit a virgin point or something like that, I'm probably taking the other one of the two remaining off, okay. and try to let the other run. So it sounds like I, you're you're uh, all in scale out. All in scale out. I find that I find that uh, scaling in as it goes with you, I can't stand losing it back. You know, I'm like, wow, I had a successful trade and I got greedy and lost it all back. So that's never worked for me. Um, I'm all in and scale out. That's okay. Uh, I see a question. What time frame charts are you trading from? So I know that you you mentioned that you have a bunch of charts up. What uh, do you have? What what I would call an entry chart, a chart that you always use to set up your exact entry. Yeah, my um, my uh, charts. Almost all of them are three minute charts. I have um, my market profile charts are 30-minute charts is the standard uh, rule. On the real long-term ones, I'll use a 405-minute for the ES, for example. Um, I use a three-minute chart with a bunch of moving averages on it that represent longer time frames. And you can set that up in Ninja Trader by the time frame, but I've done a lot of studies on that and found that there's really no particular advantage to that. So you just throw uh, various moving averages on it, so you get kind of like a rainbow on the chart, and that reminds me of what the longer term trend might be doing. And then I have a um, I have a thousand volume chart, and I particularly like that for dealing with the overnight price action. Uh, that's on the Russell, by the way, and and the ES would be a ten thousand volume. And but it it lets me see the overnight price action in usually just a couple bars. Right. And uh, so I can see the bigger picture on that. And then I've got a three-minute. And then I have a certain um, kind of breakout patterns. And I have a, uh, for that, I have a 1,000 volume, a three-minute, and a one-minute. And those are usually the charts that I'm keying my entries off of along with my volume chart. Okay. And what I use on the volume chart. And like I said, okay, go ahead. Sorry. So you you primarily trade the Russell. Do you believe that uh, the volume profile or this type of volume analysis works on any market? Does it work on stocks? Does it work on currencies? Uh, you know, in, in particular with Forex, since you don't have a centralized market, do you still think that it works on futures currencies? Um, yeah, if I were to, if I were trading Forex through a, ser a service for Forex, I would probably keep up um, a futures uh, charts and use the volume there. Um, as opposed to using TPOs on uh, on forex charts, um, I've never traded forex because I have a inherent distrust of the pricing uh, on that. But um, I know people who do. I know people who swear up and down you should trade forex in the futures market, not on the you know these other interbank uh, services that are available. But um, and I'm talking about the more liquid ones like the uh, the euro and uh, and the the uh, the yen, for example. But um, but yes, I do believe that this works in any market, and I say that simply on the basis that it's a statistical distribution of of, uh, of an auction, and so okay. it has to work to the degree that this stuff works. You know, to me. And that's why I said context, context, context. It's a context, and I try not, and then I try to under, completely understand it, and then kind of like throw it out. And so that when I'm actually trading, I'm not going, hmm. Now, you know, is it if you're above value, it's this, and you know, sure, absolutely. Now I, I kind of look at okay, where are we opening, and okay, we're kind of in this thing. Oh yeah, this seems to be what I thought was happening seems to be manifesting. I'm going to go with yeah. it. Yeah, context is king. This is why I always tell everybody there's no such thing as black and white in trading. Everyone's always looking for if I do this, if this happens, then here's the 
here's what I'm going to do. And that's just, that's, that's called a holy grail. It doesn't exist. Yeah. And, actually, and, and I, yeah. And you're right, Mike. And I, I coded systems for 15 years and, and I, I refuse, I, I have this motto, if you can't code it, it doesn't exist. And I, I held true to that. And I've gone through so many uh, alternations of systems just doing incredibly well and then failing. Not that they fail, because they wax and wane, you know. The system works for a while, and your emotions go up and down with it. And I was like, I want something more consistent. And th that's when I really started looking at uh, this profiling technique and, and, and setting up a context and trying to trade within it in a way that works for me. Because very often the systems are just unbearable to trade. You know, you get in a trade and you know it's probably not working, but then you go, no, uh, the system's got to do its thing. And you sit there and you watch it. You know, you were up 20 handles on the ES and you get stopped out the next day for 15, you know. And, right. Oh, my goodness, you know. And then, and then your emotions are going with that. And you're like, wow, my emotions are completely controlled by money. That's not right. You know, I, I don't want to live like that. And so that's when I started allowing myself to start thinking like what we're talking about in, in the webinar here. Yeah. It's been very liberating, actually, in a lot of ways. So in, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, James Dalton, of course. Um, do you have any other recommendations for people that are looking to read uh, from you know different published books that teach volume profile or just teach auction market theory in general? You know, I um, I think the and first I'll qualify that first Dalton book, Mind Over Markets, is the Bible. I wouldn't read anything before that time. You know, it's fun, kind of funny, and I'll I'll just say this very quickly. When Steidelmeier came up with this stuff they didn't know what to do with it. This is really kind of the funny thing about it because it gets this, uh, this big you know, following and everything. They didn't know what to do with this stuff. <laughs> and then they later kind of figured, well, it must mean this, you know. And they, they tried to kind of fit the, in the early years, tried to fit the trading into the box somehow, you know, and it, and it didn't work. There were even, somebody asked me a question the other day, there were services that started up so we're trying to track what the big money's doing. And I think Dalton was behind one of these. It's a big service. You can subscribe to it several hundred a month. And they they flopped because they couldn't tell what the other time frame was doing. But anyways, the very Bible to me is Mind Over Markets. Right. I but think it's that book, if you're really going to learn it, that's a big undertaking. <laughs> you you better have your heart in it or don't bother. Yeah, it's, <laughs> That's it's, a, it's tough a tough book to read, book. man. I I just then, uh, I just read a new book by John Kepler, um, and it's it's not an advanced book, but I think it's perfect for anyone that is just starting out with uh, with volume profile um, or market profile. He he largely talks about market profile, but most of what it, you know, most of it can be transferred over to volume profile pretty easily. Sure. But he does sure. a really, really good job. So my my recommendation would be if you're new to new to all this, uh, it's a pretty good book that uh, that just sets up auction market theory in general and talks about value areas and points of control and the different types of distributions and all that. But it's not an advanced book. Um, if you're, you know, Mike, I don't I don't know what your thought is on this, but you know, Dalton's second book, Markets in Profile, which is actually supposed to be a more advanced book is actually pretty pretty easy to read too. I don't know right. if, if you've read that one, but that, that's um, but you probably shouldn't go there until you get some of the basics down. So maybe this one that you you just yeah. mentioned. Yeah, uh, there's a ton of stuff. There's a ton of stuff on my blog on this subject. I just started writing, and I you know 50 articles later. Um, you know, for anybody who writes, Mike, I know you know what I'm talking about. You know, you write an, you write an article, you have eight eight hours into writing a nice article, you know. Right. So there's a lot of material there. Those, those are definitely the uh, what I would consider uh, the, the better books on this subject. Okay. Um, so I think this is a, a good time to, to wrap it up. I see a couple people asking on that book I just mentioned. It's John Kepler, K-E-P-P-L-E-R, and it's called Profit with Market Profile. It's a good beginner's book. All right, so uh, if anybody has any further questions, then uh, they can reach you on your website or send you an email, right? What was that info again? Oh, it's uh, um, rob at markettradersjournal.com. 
and then so your website is also markettradersjournal.com. Yeah, and and that that site was just you know like I said you know somebody said you know if you have a subject you really love you could write a blog on it but make sure you love it or you'll never be able to follow through with it, and so um, I just. Uh, started that. My wife had an extra site on the thing that she has, and we threw that together, and and it's grown into. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 pretty pleased with with uh, with it. But there's there's like I said, there's just a ton of ton of articles there, and you know if you have questions, and um, you know by all means I'd always answer. Right. But uh, ask through the discuss thing on there. That way other people can read it too. You know? Okay. And uh, what was your YouTube channel? Is there a link uh, on there from your uh, website? It's the uh, 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 Nindicators YouTube channel. It's uh, Ninja Indicators at, uh, contracted into one word, Nindicators. Okay. And I guess it's probably linked on your website somewhere if people are trying to find that. Uh, you know, interestingly, it's got to be on there somewhere. It's got to be on there somewhere. Uh, but what I do is I, it, it's, it's a great mini webinar for you know just looking at the overnight price action and I'm just I, I have no preparation for it I turn on my recorder and I, I prepare nothing and I just pull the charts up and talk about them and so it's just kind of like actually what I'm thinking live right before the open right you know, okay. great you know, for what it's worth yeah. all right so uh, Rob I really appreciate your time today and uh, of course I appreciate Matt for introducing you to uh, to BMT uh, so if anybody has questions that were not answered you can get a hold of Rob on his website I also want to remind everybody that the webinar was recorded and I'll post the recording probably sometime tomorrow on BMT hey uh, Mike thanks very much for the invite and I appreciate you uh, giving me the time to uh, talk yeah, same here, Rob. I look forward to having you back again. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks. See everybody okay, on the side. Thanks, everybody. All right, yep, bye. Bye-bye.